Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dan Orwig. I'm honored to be here today as the President and CEO of the National Father's Day Mother's Day Council. At this time, if I may ask you all to please rise for the singing of our national anthem by the New Amsterdam Boys and Girls Choir. Fisheries save the children. And we'll hear more about them later in the lunch. At this time, I would like you to please join me in welcoming Chris Mitchell. He is the Vice President and Publisher of GQ Magazine, and he will be presenting the 2014 Ashok Sani All-Star Dad Award sponsored by GQ. Please welcome Chris Mitchell. Thank you, Thank you. Hi, everybody. In addition to honoring four incredible fathers up here on the dais, we are also pleased to honor the 2014 Ashok Sani All-Star Dad. Ashok Sani was a beloved husband and father, and while he considered his family to be his calling, he also had a deep commitment to giving equal recognition to all. His interest in ethics, truth, love, peace, nonviolence, compassion, and moral and social responsibilities all live on through the Ashok Sani Scholar in Residence Program at New York University and the Ashok Sani All-Star Dad Award, both of which are underwritten by the Sani Family Foundation. In the spirit of Ashok Sani, GQ invited the public during the month of May to submit essays for their nominees for this year's All-Star Dad. This is a nationwide program, and we put all the power and weight of the GQ brand to make sure that as many people knew and, and uh, sent nominations for this. The All-Star Dad Award honors a father who goes beyond being a responsible caregiver, beyond being a loving mentor. We were looking for someone who gives extraordinarily to his family and to the world around him, a man whose tireless efforts make a life better for his children and for his community. This year, the National Father's Day Committee, GQ, and the Sani Family Foundation selected Robert Reed as the 2014 All-Star Dad. Uh, and the essay for this award was amazing. So I'd like to ask Julianne Reed to come up and share her winning essay on why her dad deserves this honor. thank all of you for recognizing my dad because he is a very special person. My dad raised four amazing children, including his mentally disabled yet beautifully inspirational daughter, Olivia. My little sister suffers from epilepsy and my father goes above and beyond to fight for her and all individuals with disabilities. He is the longtime admired coach of the Special Olympics swimming team in the greater Worcester area of Massachusetts. Although not required, he makes special certificates, awards, and games for all of his swimmers every year. He has walked in local and national Epilepsy Foundation relays. He is the man that carries around several Dunkin' Donuts gift cards in his pocket to give out to the homeless individuals he passes on a daily basis. He has a gratitude board, and every week he writes three things that he's thankful for on it. He is the definition of selfless. On Christmas, he helps my little sister make Christmas cards for every employee at our favorite restaurant to show gratitude. He is constantly giving to those around him, and he never expects anything in return. His motto, and he even has a tattoo of it, sorry, cat's out of the bag, anything is possible. He brings fun and liveliness to, into every situation he enters. And lastly, it's very difficult for my sister to wake up for school because of her disorder. So in order to ease the process, he actually dresses up as her favorite musician, Justin Bieber in the hat, the jacket, and the headset microphone, and sings her favorite songs to make it easier for get, to get up and to make her smile. I wanna thank my dad for everything that he's done and everything that he's taught us, because we love you. That was beautiful. Um, thank you, and Robert Reed, our 2014 All-Star Dad. Thank you. 
Wow. Um, it, it's quite an honor. It's, it's quite humbling. Um, I usually don't uh, get in front of a lot of people, but um, this is well worth it. Um, it's very unexpected. Uh, before I start, I'd like to actually recognize a few people also in some great organizations. Uh, Ashok, um, for the, Ashok, who um, developed this award and, and uh, his vision, his compassion, he certainly touched my life and uh, my family's life and, and thousands of others just through me standing here. Um, I'd like to thank the council for a phenomenal event, phenomenal organization, um, a very mission-driven, philanthropic organization. Uh, I'd like to thank um, or recognize the other honorees, uh, Governor Christie, Vince, and uh, Curtis Martin and Tony Springs. Congratulations. Uh, and also Nora O'Donnell. Donald, the, uh, I guess the best mother in the world. Is it the world or <laughs> United States? Yep. Uh, GQ Magazine and obviously uh, Save the Children's Organization. So I know I don't have much time, but I want to take a few minutes. And I guess let me start um, where I was born. Uh, I was actually born in New York, uh, in, New York in Brooklyn, uh, but I never really lived in Brooklyn. I, I actually lived in New Jersey. Sorry, Governor. Um, we lived in Scotch Plains, New Jersey, and you see my mom and dad grew up in Brooklyn, and they grew up in a, in a brownstone playing stickball. They loved the Brooklyn Dodgers. They liked Joe Lewis, the whole thing. And they had a bucket list, and one of them was to have every child born in Brooklyn, New York. So when they moved to New Jersey, my mom had to drive every time she was pregnant into Brooklyn to have us. So she's here now, and she will tell you all of her kids were born in Brooklyn. Now, the good news about New Jersey is we were actually all conceived in New Jersey. So, so that is the most important part. So New Jersey is in my heart. Um, uh, there's so much I can say, but I think to summarize, I'd like to tell a short story that actually happened to me that I think puts in perspective um, everything about being a dad and all the dads that are out there. You see, my daughter, Olivia, has a boyfriend and his name is JB. Now, now, unfortunately, JB has a lot of girlfriends. In fact, this morning when I looked at 9 a.m., he had 52,600,000 Twitter followers. So his name is Justin Bieber. That's her boyfriend. So we went to the Boston Garden to go see his concert. Now, they were sold out, and so the all-star dad here had to find tickets. So the pressure's on. I went to the secondary market, and they're very expensive. So I couldn't get the seats together. I had to get them separate. I couldn't afford both seats, but I wanted Olivia down front. When we got there, I sat next to her. She was in an aisle seat, and I, I crouched down because I had to sit next to her. I couldn't sit in my seat way up. And as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, I see the yellow shirt security guard coming up the steps, and he's got his flashlight, and he says, uh, sorry, sir, you can't sit here. And I said, well, as a dad, I'm trying to explain, I have this daughter, she has special needs, she has seizures, I couldn't get tickets together, they're too expensive. And I start, sir, you have to leave. So I was like, wow, he's got to be a Yankees fan. <laughs> so anyway, I went up to my seat, 10 minutes later, I came back down when the lights went down. And so now I'm sitting next to her on the aisle and I'm hiding. And I think no one sees me. All of a sudden, it's very dark and I see this figure coming up the steps. I don't really see him, but I see that flashlight. You know the one that just goes back and forth, like in movie theaters, you see that light, and it's like, oh my goodness, here he comes. At this time, I'm on the ground, I'm behind the chair on the concrete. All of a sudden, the vision came to me of the sound of music, and it was the scene where they were in the, uh, in the uh, cemetery, and they're hiding, and Rolf is looking for them. So here I am down behind the seats, and sure enough, the light hit my face, he says, sir, you need to come with us. So we were kind of busted. He takes us down the steps. He walks down, makes a turn, comes back up, goes through two security guards. We go through a door. We come out, and we're 10 feet from the stage. Um, and he says, uh, I want you guys to sit here. Uh, and he looked at me in the eyes, and he said, I understand it because I'm a dad, too. And so, um, 
So I think that story hopefully sums up what we all have. It's the dads that go above and beyond and can touch people they don't know. I think the other thing I recognize and take away from it is the flashlight. And I think for all the dads out there, especially Father's Day, we all have a flashlight. And we all have, I think, a responsibility with this flashlight to make sure we use it, to make sure we shine it on all our kids, and to also realize that this flashlight goes beyond our kids. That light beam is pretty powerful. So for me, and hopefully the takeaway message for you, is for dads have that flashlight. And I think we all need to use it. And lastly, I'd like to recognize my family who is in the audience out here. Um, if you guys just stand up, they're the ones that make it all possible for me. My son, Robert, he's the tall one. There's Matthew, Julianne, Olivia, who has a boyfriend, JB, as you know. I have my incredible mom from Brooklyn. My two sisters, Diane and Karen, and my fiance, Marisa. And then last, I'd like to thank my dad, who's up there. Uh, my dad was who really formed me. He was the biggest influence of my life. He's uh, kind of a jokester in a sense. He, um, he passed three years ago, uh, 10 years with Alzheimer's. And he passed actually on February 19th, 219, which is my birthday, 219. And he actually passed at 219 p.m. So it was pretty amazing that my dad was there with me and I think he was sending me a message to carry on and I hope I represent the dads out there and that's why I'm here is for everyone else, I'm just a representative and I, again, I hope all the dads out there remember their flashlight for this Father's Day. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Robert. Beautiful. Oh yeah. Hey, you already got yours last month. <laughs> Beautiful. And save the children and, and what they do for the children of our country. Now we're going to begin uh, the awards portion of this program. And our first award today goes to the governor of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie. He was sworn in as governor of New Jersey in January 2010, and he was reelected to a second term in 2013. As many of you know, he is known for his small personality. <laughs> and his modesty, but his biggest fault perhaps may be that he never really speaks his mind. <laughs> As governor of New Jersey, you know that state right across the GW Bridge, Chris Christie has taken on... <laughs> Chris Christie has taken on a bold reform agenda. For those of you, I know there's many people here who are from the state of New Jersey. He's tried to restore fiscal integrity and accountability to government. He's prioritized New Jersey's highest in the nation property taxes and reform of the state's pension and health benefit system. He has made education a top priority in an effort to give every child an ac an access to quality education. Some of you may know his background, but he graduated from the University of Delaware in 1984. He then attended Seton Hall University School of Law. He later joined a Cranford law firm where he was named a partner. He was elected a freeholder in Morris County and served as director of the board in 1997. And in 2002, Christie was named U.S. Attorney for the District of New Jersey. What you may not know about Governor Chris Christie is that he has also advocated for effective drug abuse treatment through Daytop Village, and that is a drug rehabilitation facility in Mendham, New Jersey. And he also serves on the organization's board of trustees. Last September, he and his wife, Mary Pat, were honored with the Spirit of Daytop Award for their service and work with the organization. The governor was born in Newark, he was raised in Livingston, and he has lived in New Jersey his whole life. He and Mary Pat have been married since 1986, and if you know Mary Pat, she is a wonderful, wonderful woman. They now live in Mendham, where they are raising their four children 
Andrew, Sarah, Patrick, and Bridget, please join me in congratulating 2014 Father of the Year, Governor Chris Christie. Thank you very much. Um, I know we have a short period of time, but Nora gave me so much to work with. Um, <laughs> but let me start with Robert. Congratulations to you, and, and thank you for your remarks. We have something in common. I, too, was conceived in New Jersey, so that's good. <laughs> and I think everybody who comes up here today should have to announce where they were conceived as well. <laughs> should make it really entertaining lunch. Maybe even get more specific. Not just the state or municipality, but exactly where you were conceived. <clears throat> but I won't because my daughter is here, so we're going to keep that calm. Secondly, yes, I am the governor of New Jersey. Um, it is good to be over here in a suburb of New Jersey, um, enjoying lunch. And Nora, it is now administration policy that we call New Jersey, when we're in New York, the place on the other side of the Lincoln Tunnel. Uh, I want to thank uh, the council for, for this recognition. We were um, talking amongst the group of us who are being recognized today um, about how our children reacted when this acknowledgement was announced. Uh, I was asked, how did your children react? And I have a 20-year-old son, Andrew, an 18-year-old daughter, Sarah, a 13-year-old son, Patrick, and a 10-year-old daughter, Bridget, uh, and the response was universal. They just blankly stared back at me and said, really? <laughs> and I felt very warm about that and feel, <laughs> once again, feel the warm embrace of my family. Uh, <laughs> I won't say what Curtis, Curtis is going to come up here and speak. He had a good answer, too. I'm sure he'll, he'll tell you what his was as well. But all of us, um, I think, here, uh, when it was first announced that we were getting this recognition, uh, we're surprised because I don't think when you're a parent uh, you think about what you do from day to day as something that will ever really get recognition and it's not why you do it uh, you do it I think because uh, there is nothing more precious in your life than your children and you know I I remember when our first child was born um, our son Andrew was born uh, I was with Mary Pat um, during the delivery and stayed with her during that evening and then left. And I was felt compelled to travel from the hospital to my parents' house before I went back to my home. And I came in and I looked at my mother and father and I said, listen, I can't stay long. I'm tired. It's been a really long day. But I just want to say one thing. I'm sorry. And he said, for what? And I said, remember all the times you told me I would never understand until I was a parent myself and I said you were full of it? I'm sorry. <laughs> it only took a couple of hours to understand what they had been telling me all my life, but I couldn't have any capacity to understand it until that moment when that new life came into your life and was your responsibility and also your joy. And so... Um, for me today is really recognition for the best thing that I get to do with my life. I get recognized and criticized and praised for all kinds of other things. But the most important thing that I get to do every day um, is to be a father to my four children. And it is the most lasting and important thing that I'll ever do with my life. And you hear people say that all the time, but until you're really doing it with your life, you don't have the capacity to understand what those words mean. But to the people in this audience who are here today um, to honor us, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, and especially, I think, for me now having my life be so public, uh, you owe a special debt of gratitude to your children. Because while you're trying to do for them, when your life becomes so public, they understand a lot of what your life now means. My 10-year-old daughter, Bridget, capsulizes it very well. She's the one who has spent most of her life, she's 10, 
with me and Mary Pat being in public life. And uh, one day she said to me, Dad, do you know what my least favorite words in the world are? I was intrigued. So I said, no, Bridget, I don't know. And she said, I hate to interrupt Governor Butt. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, Bridget, when people do that, they're just trying to be nice. And she said, yeah, but if they hate to interrupt, why do they? <laughs> Children bring things down to their most common denominator. And I understand that when your life is like that, your children sacrifice a lot for you being their father as well. And so for me today, um, the people that I want to thank the most for this are not the council or all of you, but it's my four children who give me the opportunity to be here, who inspire me every day, who put up with me and my crazy life, and who give me such a great sense of joy every day in my life with every little thing that they do, even when they frustrate me. They give me another opportunity to find something within myself to help them become better people. And so I do want to recognize, too, I have one representative of my family here today. But I think the rest of them are probably silently protesting. They still don't really buy this. <laughs> but my new favorite child is here today, my 18-year-old daughter, Sarah. Sarah, would you please stand up? She's right over there. You have no idea how big this is going to be for you. Absolutely no idea at all. The other three kids are now a distant fourth, fifth, and sixth, even though we only have four children. Uh, so I want to thank Sarah for being here. We're incredibly proud of her. She graduated from high school on Sunday, and it'll be becoming a freshman at the University of Notre Dame in September. And so we're thrilled for her. Go Irish. So thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you for supporting this really extraordinary organization and the work of Save the Children. And thank you for this honor today. It means a great deal to me. Beautifully said, Governor. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Curtis Martin, and he is a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Curtis Martin was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2012 after a successful career with the New York Jets and New England Patriots. Drafted in the third round by the New England Patriots in 1995, Curtis Martin ran 30 yards on his first NFL carry, scored the game-winning touchdown, and became the first Patriots player to rush for 100 yards in his pro debut. <laughs> Curtis Martin finished the year as the AFC's leading rusher with 1,487 yards and scored 14 touchdowns. He was named Rookie of the Year, all AFC, and voted to the first of his five Pro Bowls. You know, I work at CBS, and so Jim Nance, of course, calls most of the games on, on CBS. So here's where I get to use my Jim Nance voice, because I always want to be Jim Nance. That's kind of my other goal in life, to someday be a sports broadcaster. Curtis Martin then joined the New York Jets after his third season and played with them for another eight years. He had his finest moments in the second to last season when he rushed for a career-high 1,697 yards in 2004 to win the NFL rushing title. He also tied his career high of nine games with 100 or more yards rushing and was named first team all pro for the second time that season. Curtis Martin is NFL's fourth leading rusher of all time with 14,101 yards. <laughs> You know, and as I looked over Curtis's record, um, as if it weren't enough being such a fabulous running back, this is a man who has also decided to excel at giving back. 
Curtis Martin began setting aside a percentage of every paycheck to establish the Curtis Martin Job Foundation. It was initially meant to aid single mothers, right? Well, it has since been expanded to support education and housing needs, children's charities, individuals with disabilities, and includes an initiative to send surgeons to third world countries to perform operations for the poor and the uninsured. Today, Curtis Martin and his wife Carolina reside in Long Island, New York with their two daughters. Please welcome us in honoring 2014 Father of the Year Award winner, Curtis Martin. Well, thank you. Uh, well, uh, Governor Christie and I, you know, he mentioned that we were speaking in back, just to tell you a quick story. So my wife, I get a phone call from downstairs, mind you, I'm upstairs. And uh, she calls me one day and she says, so what's this father of the year stuff, you know? Um, I said, oh yeah, they, I forgot to tell you, they, they nominated me for, and that's a bad habit I have. I, you know, I, I never tell people what I'm being, you know, awarded for. I said, I forgot to tell you. She said, oh, well, they didn't ask me. <laughs> she said, what have you done? She said, maybe Father of the Day, not Father of the Year. <laughs> well, she couldn't be here because she's at home breastfeeding. We have a, a three-month-old, three so. She couldn't get away. She said, what, what have you done in your father year? I said, you know what? She asked me this today. I said, last night, our daughter, her name's Ava, she's two and a half. She has like this routine before she goes to bed. And it's so hard just to get her to go down and go to sleep. So she says, um, I'm putting her to bed. Mind you, I have to take a shower, or like she says, a wower. I, I have to take a shower with her and I have to wear my swimming trunks and I have to hold her on my back and I have to dance and play Bruno Mars and sing Locked Out of Heaven <laughs> to her, you know, and, and before I get her to go to bed. And so my wife said, well, what'd you do to get Father of the Year? I said, last night, I, I answered 22 whys in a row. You know, <laughs> she's at that phase where she wants to know why about everything. So I said, all right, Ava, it's time for you to go night-night. She says, but why? I said, because uh, it's getting late and you know, it's time to go to bed. But why? Um, because it's like eight o'clock and you see outside, it's starting to get dark. The sun is going down, but why? Well, Ava, because you know, the planets revolve around the sun <laughs> and you know, it's just the way it happens and you have to, but what? So to bore you of the other, you know, like 15 whys, you know, the conversation ended up with me saying, listen, on the seventh day, God rested. And if, if, if God had to take a rest, then Ava has to go night-night too. And you know, and, and you know, then she says, oh, okay. And she lays down. <laughs> well, uh, um, again, uh, let me get back to the point, the reason why we're here. Um, uh, this, is, this is one of the awards that I would never in a million years think that I'd ever be up here standing and receiving because you know, I, I grew up without my father. And I think there's a huge difference between having a father and having a daddy. Uh, I never had a daddy. You know, I had a father. Um, I spoke a little bit about you know, my, my relationship with my father, a man that I always loved, that I always tried to have a relationship with, but he was just unavailable. Um, he was there until I was, I believe, five years old. And I watched my father literally do some things that children shouldn't see. You know, I, I literally watched him beat my mother so bad. I mean, like, like, a, like she was a man. Uh, I, I, I've seen him, you know, take every drug in the world. And, and, and I mean, he was, one of the things that my father taught me is what not to be as a father. And sometimes I think you have to make lemon aid out of lemons. And that was my life situation. Um, one of the things that I'll never forget was my father giving me a call. 
and he says, Kurt, you know, why don't you come home? I said, all right, Dad, is there anything in particular, any reason why? He said, well, no, nah, I just want you to come home. And usually if he calls me, I know it's because he needs money or something. I said, well, you know what, I can, you need some money or anything? He said, no, I don't need any money. And that was the first time in my entire life that my father ever said he didn't need any money. And so I, I decided to go home. And uh, when I get there, you know, he's no longer living in this house. He's actually at the hospice. And so I go to visit him there. And, um, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm talking to him. And he says, you know, that cancer got me, man. Um, I said, wow. I said, so what are they saying? He said, I don't think I have one. And I went outside to speak to the doctor. I said, well, listen, doc. Um, can you just shoot straight with me? How, how, how much longer do my father have? He said, less than a month, Curtis. Um, maybe two weeks, maybe three at best. And I went in there and sat with my father, and it was the most amazing time of my life. Um, I felt like it was the first time that I had a daddy, you know, because the time that we spent in those, those two weeks, was unbelievable, and I feel like my father taught me more in that two weeks than he did in my entire 30-some years at that time that he was living. Uh, very, very uh, grateful just to have that time with him. And, and I just want to say this, because I think that it's really important. I'm sure there are some fathers and mothers in here who may not have the best relationship with their children, and some children who may not have the best relationship with their parents. but. Life is too short. You just never know when that person is going to be gone. And all these things that seem like big issues and big divides between you and your parents or you and your children, forgive them. Just forgive them. I think that was one of the greatest things that my father taught me because though he wasn't there, though I seen him abuse my mother, though you know I feel like he cho chose drugs over me, his son, uh, though he would never come to any of my games or anything, one of the greatest lessons I learned from my father is how to forgive, because I totally forgave him. And one of my greatest accomplishments in life was getting my mother, after all that she had been through, to forgive my father. It was one of the, that's my greatest accomplishment. I've been to Pro Bowls, I've, I've played in the NFL, I've done a lot with my life that I'm very proud of, but I'm most proud of being able to get my mother to forgive my father for all that he, had, he's done, he did to her. You know, um, and I know we're honoring fathers, and I'm, I'm so grateful for this honor, but I really have to honor my mother right now because Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, she taught me how to be a man. And it's because of what she taught me that I'm able to be the father that I am today to my children. And that's one of the greatest gifts out of everything that I've been through in my life. I'm so got, glad to be blessed with two little daughters and they are like my heart. And I'm so grateful to be able to be a good father to them. And I'm really thankful for you all honoring me tonight. Thank you all. To our 2014 Fathers of the Year, I'd like to extend one final congratulations to you all. We're honored that you could join us here today. Thanks again to everyone for coming and, cel and celebrating these outstanding dads. This concludes our program. Please have a wonderful afternoon and happy Father's Day to all. <laughs>